Hi, I'm Brett Johnson, former United States Most Wanted cyber criminal, now good guy, and host of The Brett Johnson Show. Today's episode is episode number 73, Mark Quibell. That's right, Mark Quibell. So who the hell is Mark Quibell, you ask? Well, I'm going to tell you who Mark Quibell is. Let's start off by sharing a nice little picture of Mark. So there's Mark. You see the that outstanding hat, those steampunk glasses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it turns out that Mark Wabell, and this is his bio, he's a cybersecurity blue team expert with over 30 years of professional IT experience. In addition to being an InfoSec skills author, he's a consultant, security architect with a bachelor's in science in tech information management from Upper Iowa University and an associate of Applied Science and Computer Systems Networking from Texas State Technical College in Waco. Mark has a CISSP certified since 2009 and was previously CCNA, MCSE, and CRISC certified. So that is Mr. Mark Quibell. We sit down, we have a talk about security, apathy, a lot of other things, and maybe just some life talk in general. So Please enjoy the discussion with Mark Quibell. Without further ado, <laughs> and then and then you have to contact the person you talked to. And Let's say, do hey, this again. Uh, uh, we had technical difficulties, and finally you tell them, <laughs> "Hey, I, I forgot to press record." <laughs> <laughs> or unmute myself. <laughs> so, hey, what we'll do is, uh, if you want to, we'll just dive into it. Uh, yeah, you, you seem you to like again? to bitch a bit. Uh, yeah, you can ask me again. But uh, you seem to like to bitch a bit, a bit about cyber, and <laughs> you you come off as a bit jaded at times. I just want to bitch when you're on the bitch. When you're on the bitch, I want to be on that bitch. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. So let me get started. We'll just roll right so, into it. Question I asked you. you ready? All right. All right. You ready? Ready. Hi, I'm Brett Johnson, former United States Most Wanted cyber criminal, now good guy, and host of The Brett Johnson Show. Today's episode, we've got a very special guest, Mark Quibell. How are you, sir? Fine, sir. How are you? Dude, I'm doing all right, really. I, I'm excited to have you on the show. As you know, I, <laughs> I'm i kind of a solo operation most of the time. I just get on here and drone around for, you know, an hour two hours sometimes and sometimes i get to the point sometimes i don't yeah, two three hours i know right <laughs> so hey I, look we talk to each other on linkedin all the time and um you know we were talking about you coming on the show about a topic and i don't think there's really any better topic to talk about that will allow us to kind of bitch together than asking you what is wrong with cybersecurity these days because i've got a lot of apathy toward companies and security companies and just a lot of people too yeah that's very true but let me start by this mr johnson i want to ask you a question i've been wanting sure. to ask you since you are known as the godfather of the internet can i call you don johnson don johnson don so johnson you, you want me to do marlon brando too yes sir please come <laughs> You asked me to do you this favor, but for four years, you never come in my house. You never do me a favor. This I cannot do. That's, that's perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Don Johnson. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's just, uh, I, I tell you, Mark, I've got, um, and I, you've probably noticed it on LinkedIn if you've watched my show, too. I, I, I've got... It's either people that aren't speaking up, that know the, the, the crap that's going on, or it's security companies that, you know, they're only worried about profit. They're not worried about really doing anything to stop, you know, the crime or the problems that's going on out there. It's regulations, which I, I'm sure you've seen these idiots in Congress talking about anything from cybersecurity to crypto, and it's just blank faces. So I, I've got <laughs> a lot of apathy across the board right now. Yeah, I don't understand the crypto thing. I mean, why would you do invest in something that's not really there? I know, I know, <laughs> I know. Well, you know, if if you're a criminal, it's pretty cool 
That, you know, you can, yeah. use, you can use Monero or Bitcoin and buy your drugs, uh-huh. your credit cards, what have you. And it, it works out pretty well like that. I, I don't really understand, you know, much anything else about it. Uh, that, that's kind of a lie. I do know that uh, the merchants who who started to accept crypto, you know, three, four years ago, there, at one point, Microsoft was accepting a few, a few other big online merchants. And they were accepting Bitcoin and they were only getting like three, four hundred dollars a month total in Bitcoin exchanges. So not not a whole hell of a lot of traffic on the local mm. side of things, you know. So there you go. So, let me uh, you know, I wanted to ask you or not ask you, make a comment on some things that I've seen in the cybersecurity world that really kind of pushes my button a little bit. Let's are these what articles? Your buttons. So let's start with these articles that are all over the place about cybersecurity, especially when some of these guys or gals get on LinkedIn and all of a sudden they have a lot of followers. I don't know how, maybe they press a lot of invite buttons. I'm not sure how that works, but uh, next thing you know, they've got 50,000 followers and now they've started to change a little bit. They're starting to point out these articles out there that, you know, list surveys and studies and at the very end, there's something that they want to sell. <laughs> right, right. So that's not really news. And, uh, you know, that seems to be the latest thing now in cybersecurity is trying to sell services. That's, you know, they're trying to to uh, make this something more than it really is, right? right? And then, so now that they have you in that mindset, this is how we can prevent that, you know, with our tool. Or, right. And that's something that really gets me. I mean, I wish people would not propagate that. Well, it, it's, and I, I talk about this, I've been talking about this now for a few months is, you know, you get a security company that they'll tell you, you only need our product. You know, the, these are the <laughs> product. And, and so, you know, I've worked in corporate by now. I no longer work in corporate. I'm now just doing the speaking gigs and I'm happy with that. I'm happy with my show, but uh, you know, I, I've worked with more than a few companies and typically these companies will put out a report, you know, the cybersecurity or cybercrime report for the year, for the quarter, by and whatever the hell the report is. And it yeah. comes it come to find out that the problems that they find, the only problems according to them, it just so happens that their product or service cures those problems. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. And what I've been saying is, is basically that is cybersecurity pillow talk. That's hmm. the same thing as telling somebody, I, w- I will respect you in the morning. Everything's going to be just fine. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, that's just, uh, I don't know, man. Excuse me. I don't know if you can hear my dog in the back. I've got a small chihuahua, and it's barking at something right now. <laughs> Don Johnson's chihuahua. Don Johnson's chihuahua. <laughs> yes, yes. But uh, how long have you been in cyber? I've been in IT uh, for over 30 years. What caused you to go into it? Uh, I've always wanted to. I've always been a nerd. You know, it uh, before, long before I went, you know, when, when I was in high school, mm-hmm. I think I told you this story last time I was on a few years ago. Uh, we had these teletype machines. Remember that story? And I do remember. With that. the rolling paper. Right. Yeah, and I was typing on somebody else's machine while they were trying to program and spitting out errors, and they're trying to figure it out for a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've uh, I've always been in computers. I got uh, I wanted to go in the Air Force, but uh, they were too busy at the time. So right, I went into the Marines as an MP, and, and you know that story. But uh, once I got out, I did kind of get back into. I was able to go back to college, right, and uh, train myself in. Uh, in uh, technology information management okay do so some you, networking back when novell was a big thing <laughs> right so you you've you've been in this industry for a while right? oh yeah and and what i would like to know is has there ever been a point in this industry when it wasn't just geared toward profit <laughs> what's not <laughs> <laughs> i mean what what know, <clears throat> it, yeah what's what's not i mean it's uh it's like any other business but uh you know, I tell you one thing, when viruses came out, mm-hmm. everybody was saying McAfee was putting out those viruses. Right, right. Right? With, with John <laughs> you know, McAfee, I mean, let's... John... 
I mean, he's a little nuts. Right? Well, that dude, you know, he played he's, Colonel I mean, Kurtz now, in the but... forest there for a while. So, I mean, it could happen. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, you know, and that was a big rumor back then. And he was, that's how he was selling his product, which by the way, I want to ask you this question. Uh, when was the last time you heard of the word virus? Well, it's been a minute. So all of a sudden now, <laughs> all of a sudden now, viruses have disappeared in the last few years. Right. No one That's worries about viruses. Amazing. It's malware now. Right. That's what it is. Yeah. And even then, you know, I was reading on uh, not too long ago, somebody was saying, and this was one of those articles, you know, there's a top 10 antivirus. And the first one was Kapersky or whatever, it is, however you say that. <laughs> and, you know, and it listed ransomware as a virus. Oh, did it? And, uh, I'm thinking, you know, ransomware is not a virus. Right. It's it's a uh, it's a long list of commands and actions. <laughs> it's right. activities right. that lead up to one final group of commands that will kick off total annihilation. <laughs> right. You're right. You're absolutely right. So ransomware, as we all know, is a is an, a line of activities that gets to the final goal. And somehow they were listing ransomware as a virus. And, you know, that's you're still doing that stuff, trying to sell their products on those sites. So you just got to don't fall into those traps. No, I, exactly. And, and, you know, I, I don't know what to say, man. I, I really don't. I mean, I, I've, I've been. <laughs> I'll I tell you what my problem is, Mark. And well, I, I've asked you. Sure. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, you haven't, you haven't heard of viruses because viruses have been kind of defeated. We've gotten better. Microsoft, the number one person who should be securing themselves against malware and malcontents around the world now is Microsoft. They know their own code. It's been a source, close, closed source code forever. Well, I, you know, solar winds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so uh, they finally got smart because the thing about networking and having windows and computers is convenience is number one security has never been their number one goal it's right. always been ease of use and convenience so you've got to balance that with some kind of security they've been trying to do that for decades and i think they and by having something like microsoft defender on your hosts which has gone through years of not being so good to now it's a lot better and now we have browsers like Google Chrome or Firefox that update automatically, and they have a lot of security built in. So all, all right. those combined, I think, help us stay protected against those traditional type viruses, signature-based stuff. But now we have more uh, intelligent XDR, HIPs, whatever you want to call them, uh, on these workstations that monitor activities now more than right. it does uh signatures so it's get it's changed a lot throughout the years i think it's getting better so let me ask you if you could if you can do that against viruses why can't you do the same type of stuff when it comes to identity authentication to the malware that's out there to phishing campaigns to all these other issues that are out there right now or really we're really making it too easy see within with the operating system Microsoft has control, so they they lock it down for the most. People have been locking, companies have been locking these down more and more throughout the years, at the expense of breaking something, <clears throat> or breaking uh, you know usability. Right. So you've got to still maintain that balance. What was the question? Again? So, so we we've effectively shut down viruses. All right. Right. Yeah. Why can't we do the exact same thing? So if you look at if you look at cybercrime. You've got problems with identity because most financial cybercrime has an element of identity theft. So you've got problems authenticating the user, that that, that person is the person that's signing into the bank account or using credit cards online or what have you. You've got that issue. You've got the issue of the malware that's out there. You mentioned uh, ransomware, whatever the hell is being dispersed out there. You've got phishing campaigns that, that get launched. So if we could, if we could effectively shut down viruses, why can't we do the exact same thing with these other issues? that are so rampant right now. Yeah, you're right. Viruses, no one no one gives a damn about a virus anymore at all. But they do care about this, you know, the, the phishing stuff, the uh, credential stuffing, the 
financial theft, the identity theft, the ransomware that goes on, the EC campaigns, everything else. So why can't we end that stuff as, as effectively as we have viruses? There's that the human element that's the problem. People are just falling into these traps of these phishing emails. It never ends. It seems like, you know, uh, wherever you work, you may have a phishing campaign, right? Right. And just the same people failing, failing that test because they're just not, I don't know, aware enough or they just don't care or however that goes. And there's always that insider element as well. But for, forget that for now. Sure. It's the people factor. You know, people don't want to use multi-factor. People have to memorize all these damn passwords that are too long where do we put them what do they do with them well let's put them online to one of these online passwords and all of a sudden now it's compromised <laughs> we've heard of that before well it's been in the news um, so recently it's, yeah it's a difficult thing yeah for the user it's difficult because especially as you get older right so we're getting older mm. and uh they're going to start targeting us more because we kind of start to lose our facilities after a while and it's easy to con older people. So, right. you know, they're coming up with phishing campaigns and smishing campaigns where they will actually call you. You know, the fish would say, call us to, to uh, you know, stop this service or cancel it. And we'll do that. So people call that number and they're actually calling the fishers right. who are <laughs> getting other information from them. So it's, you know, the... The uh, bad guys have stepped it up a lot. They've included a lot of targeted campaigns where usually it's just kind of a, a blanketed attack, like a scanning on the Internet. That happens all the time. Sure. And now they're targeting people. And as you become a victim, as you know, you get on the victim the victim uh, sucker list. So <laughs> that's not always helpful. <laughs> right. right. And uh, so, like I said, it's it's the human element and and that's involved with all this, and that's that's a problem today. You know, how how well do you expect people to secure their accounts? It's up to them. So what else are you gonna do? No, I, and, and hey, I, I I grant you, it's the human element. I mean, I I talk all the time about you compromise the human always. That's the first line of attack. Now, if everyone knows that, and I think everyone, hopefully to God, by this point, everyone knows that then if you if you understand the human is going to screw up i mean you were talking about smishing campaigns for example i mean so so if someone's trying to uh, defraud people using zelle for example the phone company <laughs> is they're, they're able to see that those numbers are spoofed that are coming that are being sent out or you know that it's a mass sms campaign that goes around so i mean the tech the tools are there to stop these types of crime regardless of the human screwing up my my thing yeah. is is why aren't we doing that i, I and the, re the reason i mentioned that and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the sms stuff i actually spoke to um, an individual from bank of america a few months ago and we got in an argument about zelle because i was like they need to you know shut its ass down no one needs to use it right now because it's wide open for crime and the guy was like you know hey we're we, we're trying and he was telling me, he was like, hey, the problem is, is that the phone company absolutely sees that it's fraud coming across. We get information from the phone company, but the phone company does not deliver that information in a timely manner. Sometimes the phone company doesn't deliver it for a month. And by that point in time, all the crime has already happened. So, I mean, what, what can we do to take the human error out of that? because the tools and the services and the products are there to stop most of this crime that's going on. I mean, where does where do we draw the line and start to say, okay, yeah, it may cause more friction. It may disrupt or, or disrupt some user experiences, but this is what we need to do to be more secure. And at the same time, we make it more convenient. Right. Let's do this all online. Let's put our passwords online. Let's put our bank online, but only use one factor of authentication. Yeah, you got to Or that. only have one factor of authentication available. How long did it take the banks, I say the big banks, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, to get multi or two factor authentication 
let's just go with two factor right now. The SMS simple one, which is easier, easiest to hack. Uh, but back then, let's say five years ago, they offered online banking, but only one factor is an occasion. They seem to be always behind the criminal activity. That's the I problem. Agree. It's always been the problem. I agree. So why don't you think about this? And when you put this out there for everybody to use, how about securing it down and locking it down along with the service? So, yeah, it's going to be people are going to be excited to go online, but, well, they may not be excited having to use a phone number, you know, or something for another factor of authentication. You know, back then, maybe phones weren't. Uh, out there as much as they used to be right. yeah, <laughs> so right. you had that problem too and you remember all these uh these fools around the world calling on you and spoofing their numbers they're right. still doing that even after the fcc locked down these folks these phone companies that have these caller ids implemented somehow i'm still getting all these calls that have no caller id you're right you know you're right how, how is that still possible well i don't know i'm not in there but it could be that They've done that. It's just not working very well, which is pretty typical. So I don't know what the answer is, but uh, I think start. you should start with deploying technologies that are a lot more secure than what we used to be doing. So how do we you get know? that started? I mean, so if, it, if it's a systemic problem, which I, I, I keep believing that, okay, yeah, it is. Because you've got all these different verticals that need to work together and they're not because, hey, we want to be paid. And then regulation is not informed or educated on any of that bullshit so how do, how do you get to the point where you're able to get these things working in unison where everything's copacetic across the board well that'll never happen <laughs> <laughs> i mean unless you're uh you know maybe you're like the ccp over there and you monitor everything and manage everything in china right. <laughs> yeah, you're right you're there's right. a government oversight to everything so, but, so uh, that's just it. Then I mean, they're, they're, it's never going to happen. Yeah, because we have so much freedom out there. We have so much uh, open source software that's coming out. So much GitHub activity. All those, uh, all those applications on a daily basis. I don't know how many applications hit Git, Git, uh, GitHub, but everybody's trying to get in on that action, and, it, and it's a pretty cool action. Uh, I'm not a programmer, but I do do some scripting. But uh, you know, you get yourself up there, and people start using it. You get pretty good you know feeling of, of accomplishment there and it feels good but um the thing that has always scared me is it's open source it's wide open and github is now kind of a high target with hackers they want to get their uh, supply side supply chain software in there right and as we know a lot of that software comes from github like like log4j and pypy that python package that was recently hacked and replaced right. on github and so that's there's a risk to everything, I think, yeah. and uh, crooks and criminals nowadays are, are targeting those online repositories, and, and the gold mines are the clouds. It's the clouds now. It's not the individual workstation, or actually, they find, they're find they finding that it's harder to get into on-premise networks, so they go towards the, prep, the cloud, because all you got to do is scan over, there, scan over there and say, you know, Amazon's got this open uh, tenant or whatever, this open server, and it just takes a few scans, and next thing you know, you've got an army bot or bought a, a bot army of half a million <laughs> just right. from a day's work. So people aren't configuring them properly, and uh, the owners of those uh, cloud services aren't really. Maybe they should be more involved with that. You know, if, then well, maybe well, they should be proactive about that. Well, let me ask you. So, so on cloud services, whose job is it to do that? Is it the company's job to to make sure everything is configured properly, or should it be the cloud service provider? I think it should be both, but it's not. So if you have, you know, the different cloud services, there's SaaS, right. PaaS, IaaS. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you say it? That's how you IaaS. say it. What it should be. <laughs> uh, platform as a service, all kinds of stuff as a service. So right. then there's different security model, models for each one of those services. Like for SaaS, you're just responsible for the application security, whereas Platform as a service where you run the Windows operating systems or the Linux operating systems. You're responsible for the operating systems and the application systems, right. et cetera. So those 
responsibilities change depending on the services. But I think still that uh, if it were me running a, a cloud service, I would probably be more proactive and say, hey, I found this open configured item and all your data is just spilling all over the place. You might want to clean that up a little bit. So, you know, here's what we re recommend you do. <laughs> Does anybody get that or do that anymore or at all on yeah, the cloud? Exactly. I don't know. Yeah. And so, so you think it's, you know, you're talking about this and, and what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, I guess what I'm, what my train of trail of thought is, is going is, okay, so you take a, a fortune 500 companies, one of these big ass companies, they can afford to hire people that know how to do that. Yeah. But you take an SMB, maybe not. So at that point, what happens? What do you, what do you mean an SMB? Small so yeah, business? Small, small, medium business. Yeah, okay. Yeah, true. I mean, that's always been a problem, too. Everybody's out there on the, on the internet. You know, mom's uh, dance shop over there on 5th Street. Right. <laughs> and all their daughters, it's on there. And stuff's wide open. No, Everybody can see it. I mean, right. it's uh, that's a problem, too. It's the, uh, the internet community that America, all these countries are on the net. I remember uh, doing a, uh, oh, what was I doing? Uh, I was doing something called, it's kind of hard to hear what it is, Google dorks. <laughs> Things plug in my ear, I can't hear. <laughs> I was doing uh, do what's called a Google dorks. And basically that's kind of like uh, making searches that are not really what other people would search for. So it's kind of like, you know, I want to search in these URLs, this camera, because these cameras come with internet connectivity and it includes these U these url paths and a file name or a directory name okay so i'm gonna do a search on that next thing you know i'm in pakistan uh on the camera in a market and i'm going hey this is pretty cool i didn't you know i've been to afghanistan but not, pa not right. pakistan <laughs> let me uh yeah <laughs> so you know and, and there, was, there was another one at a uh uh one of these universities at a nasa i don't, don't remember if it was nasa or nuclear uh lab or something like that but right. you could see somebody was monitoring the servers and it was all over the network everybody could see that but they are they found it convenient to put their servers on a camera to make sure they're running so they can do it from home in the meantime they didn't lock it down so of course not right so I mean, it's, we're always playing catch up the world will always play catch up to security uh because there's people out there who are smarter than us we have nothing else to do but hammer at things twenty four seven. I mean, and you're, you're going to win. Right. You're right, but but at the at the same time, like like the camera example, for, uh, for example. Yeah. Okay, so so you've got a bunch, no other word for it. You've got a bunch of, of idiots that are just putting the shit out there without worrying about securing anything down at all. All right, but at, uh, someone in that chain knows how to lock this stuff down. You know, the, the camera manufacturer. Somebody ha has an idea of how to lock this down. So why not, by default, have the damn thing locked down instead of it just being wide open to begin with? You know, we've got uh, one of the stats that I throw out during conferences is, you know, 41% of all the routers have the default password. And that doesn't right. include all the billions of IoT devices that are hard coded and all this other yeah. shit that are out there. So, so why are we putting out products that out of the gate have these issues instead of putting out products that are, are locked down because it's convenient it goes back to convenience it's easy to have a default router and you have to you know if you ever have to reset the configuration of that you hold down the button for 10 seconds and everything goes back to the original right right uh, if you're dumb enough to leave it like that or maybe you just forget about it which is a screwed, lot of people but, that uh, just leave it like that yeah and some of them didn't know better. Nowadays, you would think that would there would be something better to prevent, to help uh, the pe people in their stupidities. <laughs> but I, I mean, how, then, like I don't think routers, there are. For example, how, well, you take a router. So, so you plug the damn thing in, and why not have it as your part of the setup? Is hey, you've got to do the password stuff right now in order to go to, to step B, C, D, you've got to take care of A, which is you set up a password instead of the default password. It's, it's a mandatory that you change that. Now, if, if 
Now, I grant you it's, it's convenience, but if every single router manufacturer implemented the exact same thing, then it's, it's equal friction across the board, and that's not, not going to deter someone from installing a router. They're going to learn how to do that stuff. You know, they're going to pull a YouTube video or what, whatever, whatever and walk through that and do that bullshit. But, and, and that's, that's, that's the thing that, that is bothering me, I guess, so damn bad right now, man, is, is we're not doing this simple bullshit that we need to be doing to stay secure. I had a talk yes, yesterday. I had a talk yesterday. This, this kid, um, he's on Telegram. He's a fraudster. <laughs> he got up with me on, on, uh, on uh, on Twitter, and he had watched that episode that I did about the good guys sucking. About uh, yeah, I've watched Nightmare. some of that. Yeah, it's funny. So I I was wanting to do a show on uh, Blue Acorn and some of these pandemic people, and the guy he was like, "Hey man, you need to do the show. I want to talk to you about it." So we spent an hour talking about the the way that these fintech companies have facilitated fraud, and it was just a fascinating call, and and and. During that hour, I mean, the point keeps coming up of, you know, they're just not doing what they need to do, you know, because they're they're pocketing money or because they're too lazy to do it or because it's the user experience. But at the end of the day, it's just you're not doing what needs to be done to secure yourself against attackers who, let's be honest, they're not rocket scientists. And I don't get that. I don't know why why it's so damn difficult to lock things down against Telegram people. Yeah, and they're making it easier now too. With, they are uh, as a service, hacking yeah. as a service activities, they are. ransomware um, as a service, whatever. Ransomware as a service, you know, you've got this new thing with uh, with evil proxy. I say new; it's been around, but you've got this thing with evil proxy or Genesis that's stealing cookies for cookie injections, so you don't have to worry about the passwords anymore. It, you get some lazy developer, and and let's be honest, those lazy developers are at the big nine banks as well. That you know. You bypass one MFA and you bypass them all with a cookie. <laughs> so it's <laughs> it's like you okay. also have a something called code as a service. From what I'm hearing, you have that as well. And then uh, now we're going to have AI, which would, of course, uh, accelerate uh, what people can program or ask to have programmed, right? Without really having to pay for it either. So it's making everything easier. I mean, it, so let's it's say for your example. Yeah, yeah. So your example of uh, you know, let's let's go through a question scenario for setting up a, mach a machine or a router or Wi-Fi router or whatever. Mm -hmm. If we do that and we say, well, you have to set your password, and then they forget that password, they got to do it all over again. <laughs> okay, you got it. You got it. All right. You, it's you so got much it. easier to have that written down. <laughs> I mean. I mean, you that's exactly you how, how some son of a bitch gets into a PayPal account. All right. That's exactly <laughs> how I forgot my password. You click the link and by God, you're in You're You're exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> because you've got to go toward the lowest common denominator. And we're still using passwords, which is a, it's a pain because, oh wait, my, I don't know about you. But I'm going to tell you my password, uh, how I store passwords. How, do, how I, do you store? Yeah, let let me know. Let me grab a pen here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't mind saying it on air. Uh, but my password list has always been behind me on the other side of this uh, partition. Okay. So for That's someone it. to get it, <laughs> they, for someone to get your password list, they would have to break into your home. Which I see that bump, that sticker, that that Semper Fi there, which tells me that you are probably well protected in your house. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and not only well protected, but well trained. And you remember, I was an MP, so I know how to use a pistol. Exactly, exactly. And it's, and that's okay. So, well, then I'm not done. Okay, I actually do have a uh, electronic version. Uh, and it is in a file on a USB device. Okay. And you have to mount that file as a Linux directory or as a Linux mount. And then that file is password protected. So there's 
couple different layers of protection, I guess. Yeah, that's good. So you got to mount it. You got to mount it properly, and uh, and you actually mount the executable file, which is uh, something nobody would think of doing right. normally. No, you're right. And there's another password. They wouldn't. Okay, but and, you know, and... what do users do though? What do normal users do, do with their pat? What, what does Brett? What does Don Johnson do with his passwords? Okay, I'm well, sure Don. Don Johnson is not out there putting his passwords on. What was the name of that site that uh, leaked Last all the pass. Last pass. I do not use LastPass. You're Thank absolutely you. right. <laughs> I, I absolutely <laughs> do not. I do have. I do have a handy. Man, one. there we go. Perfect. <laughs> My wife uses the same thing, so good. And you know the bad thing about it is, is I get static from 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 all these IT people on LinkedIn about saying, "Hey, there's not a damn thing." wrong with using one of these because nobody's going to break in my house that's right my wife has so i'm 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 now in the second living room because i had to convert to this to my office but there's a gun safe about eight feet away now i don't have access to it because i'm a convicted felon but my <laughs> wife my wife is well on well armed and, and knows how to use that that remington 870 that's in there <laughs> good, good. I don't have a safe because I don't have kids anymore, so I'm not worried about that. Plus, it's you know, if, if it's between me and a crook and whoever's getting into my house, that safe better not getting away. <laughs> You're right. You're right. But see, I we have to have a safe because I'm not allowed access. Yeah. So I, I do have uh, many sharp objects laying around. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's sharp objects, blunt instruments. That pen that's in your hand. I'm allowed exactly. Exactly. So, okay. So we're not going to solve the password problems because, you know, I wish we would, you know, and then there's biometrics or whatever. What do you think about biometrics? We've not talked uh, about that. I got to tell you this, this story. Okay. Uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago, actually more than 12 years ago. <laughs> what year is it? 2023? Yeah. <laughs> um, there was this cool biometrics multi-factor authentication that came up, and it was how you typed on your keyboard. Right. The rhythm of your typing. Right. And I can even tell and, you the so company, but I it. won't. <laughs> it start with bio something. It did. Bio rhythm. <laughs> bio something. You're almost there. And, uh, it's what you do yeah. with a fish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, lore, bio lore. Uh, so we were, we're testing this, and I said, okay, I told my buddy, okay, I'm going to type my password in, right? And uh, I want you to see if you can get in. So he does this, and he gets right in. <laughs> I said, yeah, okay, next product. Well, that was that was that, that many years ago, of course. Right. But, um, you know, as with fingerprints and I, iris scans and... Your smell. I don't know what else they're using nowadays. Your right. personal odor. I don't know how you blink. Uh, well, they do that. that. They absolutely do that. Once you get all that in a system, it's vulnerable. Right. That's the problem. It's all vulnerable. No matter you know how cool it is on the outside, how unique and success successful it is to scan fingerprints. Because they're unique, or your iris scan, because that's unique. Once it gets all online, uh, it has to compare that information to something online. That's where the hackers attack. That's where they get that information. So, I don't know what what the answer is anymore. Maybe it's well, a. Well, let me ask you, because because there's there's a couple of companies that are trying to to answer that problem, and I agree with you. That is an issue. Once it's there, it's vulnerable. So there's a couple of companies that are working on taking that that data that set of biometrics and then dispersing it across many different machines and having it encrypted so that it no it's not stored any one place the whole the whole file is so do you think that that is a solution or not i have this uh former co-worker who was the boss at redspin when redspin was a good company back in when it was a good company. 
five years ago, like six, okay. seven years ago. Uh, sorry. Yeah, because they got bought out, but it was always a good company. But his name is John Ad, John Abrams, and he's on LinkedIn. Okay. And he's really into blockchain. I right. think what you're talking about is blockchain. Uh, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And the guy's, I think, a genius at it because whenever he tries to explain it to me, I don't understand. So, <laughs> and he's, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he's very uh, knowledgeable in that area. And so he would be a person to, to ask that question if you ever to, to uh, come across that name. I will look at him. But it sounds, uh, I still don't understand it. So I can't, in terms of security wise, right. I, you know, I know that it is like uh, distributed uh, computational uh, mathematics that are involved, but I just don't know exactly how secure that is. Right. And because I, I at some point, that either. yeah, at, at some point you've got to get all that together ping, and now you've got your comparison is this person who they say you are they are and that's the point where i would hack it right because right. it's all together now right so i don't know it's, i can't answer your question yeah and, and again i can't i'm not i'm not smart enough on that to to answer that that either but you're absolutely right i mean so it's, it's dispersed across that distrib distributed ledger system what have you yeah and then when it comes back together that would be the point of compromise absolutely it would be every day so I, I'm not sure how that's protected, and that's that's a very good point. Um, I tell you what I what I would like to talk about because you're former military. So we've got, I'm I'm giving a presentation in Sweden next month, and what I'm talking about is how ideology is now influencing these cash based these Telegram type criminals that are out there just to steal money because we've got both Russia and the Ukraine that are going at it, and they basically said, hey, attack targets on our behalf. And what we're starting to see now on Telegram is we're starting to see some of these guys that are justifying their crimes by saying, you know, I support Russia or I support Ukraine. So at the end of the day, and, and you know, you've, 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 been in the, you've been in the mess. I, I, I was never fortunate enough to I never have my head on my shoulders enough to, uh, to enter the military, but you've been in the muck. So how does this shit end when, you, when you're now telling these attackers that typically need that justification that, hey, you can support our country? <laughs> kind of like a, <clears throat> hacktivism. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Except that hacktivism is now mixed with profit. There's no, there's no profit in crime. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know man you can tell we, we keep telling ourselves <laughs> yeah you know those pandemic guys i mean you can try to tell them that but uh yeah how, how, how do you dissuade people from doing that and making better use of their time uh is there a better cause and then how is that would that be a subject of your talk that is don't, don't talk. so what I'm what I'm talking about. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you've seen me rattle on about, you know, motivations of crime. You've got status, cash, ideology. Mm -hmm. Cash is the top of the food chain. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. Then you've got status. How do you impress your criminal peers? And then finally, you've got ideology. Are you ticked off at somebody? But what happens now when you've got a mixture of ideology and cash based attacks? So over in over in Sweden, they had um, they got a DDoS attack against some infrastructure stuff over there recently because of, of their role in in this Ukraine war. And they were their rail system was hit. A few other infrastructure services were hit, um, both with DDoS and ransomware. So what happens when you when all of a sudden you've got attackers that are interested that have been historically interested in hitting stuff just for cash, but now you're mixing ideology with that. And my thought process is that, well, you, you start to look at different types of targets all of a sudden. You look at rail systems, you look at infrastructure, and how can we profit by that, but also satisfy that ideology? And I, I just think that's a very dangerous thing all of a sudden. Yeah, I think so too. It's uh, What is that group, Anonymous? Yeah. Um. I wonder if they're still active. I don't know, but they um, are, uh, actually, I, I, the interesting thing about Anonymous, I, I got to uh, to talk to the two founders on 
Le- uh, not LinkedIn, but on Twitter of all places. And we talked for several hours and those guys are no longer in it. But what's happened is, is you, you had, you had the hacktivist that were absolutely, you know, we want to do the right, whatever they thought the right thing was. We want to do the right thing. But as time went on, they had to eat too. So a lot of them went over to credit fraud. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, and, and now you're seeing that with, with the Ukraine and Russia, Russia especially has been like, Hey, yeah. Attack those people who are against us. And who do they, who, who are they talking to? Any of those other Russians, the other Russians, people on telegram, everything else. So you, so you think about it, your, your marketplace vendors, the majority of those at host at the wholesale level, a majority of those people are either Ukrainian or they're Russian. So at the wholesale level, when you're when you're doing those man in the middle attacks, when you're stealing credit card information, a lot of that information is stolen by those two groups. All right. Mm. Then they farm it out and finally it it hits down to those English speaking guys that typically are not very well skilled in getting anything. They're skilled at committing crime. Yeah. But what happens at the top of that food chain? When all of a sudden you've got these these wholesalers that are like, "Hey, support us," you know, support us. We we need your help, and it's not. It, it goes even further than that because now what you're seeing. When I was running Shadow Crew, we had a uh, we had a very good relationship with Russian and Ukrainian cyber criminals, and they they were mixed in fairly well. Well, what happens is, is basically when Shadow Crew, along that same time that Shadow Crew shuts down, the Russian speakers started to understand that the English speakers were fucking idiots. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they really did. We talk way too much. And and because of that, there was a schism that happened. So now you had just the, the Russian speakers tended to stay in their own lane on their own channels. That's not happening now because of both Ukraine and Russia saying, hey, everybody's got to fight. You're Cyber criminals are not fighters; they're lovers, and they're barely that. So, so they're they're fleeing the countries all of a sudden, and not only fleeing the countries, but fleeing those those channels where they've been all the time. And now they're you're starting to see them coming into back into those English speaking environments, which is kind of interesting because all of a sudden that skill level is starting to ramp up, and not only the skill level, but also the chatter that's influencing the ideology of the rest of the players in there. I mean, it's it's really screwed up when you think about it. Yeah, uh, what we've seen recently is the continued uh, international police cooperations right. that have happened, uh, the shutting down of a lot of these uh, rogue sites, you know, between Interpol and I think Ukraine was involved. Ukraine uh, authorities have been involved recently too, so that that does help. Uh, you know, it's hard to find. It's hard to fight that money effect. You know, if if you all you had to do was flip a switch or whatever on your side. Well, and we've also seen, by the way, a huge increase in the effect of botnets. They're talking terabytes and terabytes now. From what I've read from FBI stories, of uh, now even larger and more effective botnets, even this last month. So that's that's not a good thing for your speech. That's, that's a, not help it's anything. Not. <laughs> no, but I, uh, you know, how do you dissuade? I don't know. It, uh, you know, other than putting the fear of God in them which pretty much impossible now, but maybe the fear of uh, law enforcement or somebody's going to come after you right. might be a better avenue. Because there does seem to be more concerted effort worldwide there to is. track these people down. There is. And you've probably seen some of that on the inside because you are you have unique access more than I have. Yeah, I mean, it, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's there's a, a there's an absolute concerted effort to do that. And, and you've got all these countries that are working together to do that. You know, the problem is, is that you don't have a whole lot of numbers. Yeah, and then what happens to them when they they right. live go or <laughs> right, right? Is that enough? Uh, 
is that enough of a deterrent or does it work at all? Or I mean, like, I don't know. like the guy that I spoke to yesterday and, and we spoke for an hour and um, he missed out when he got arrested. He was running 80 different accounts on SBA fraud. So that, that specific fraud was paying um, up to 150 K for the SBA farm loans on the, on the pandemic. All right. Mm. And he got popped because he was pulling cash out of ATMs on uh, stolen debit cards. Idiot. All right. He should have stuck with the pandemic. He would have been fine, but he was telling me that that, that was common. The channel that he was in probably profited, you know, 40, 40 different people pocketed around $60 million total on pandemic fraud. All right. And those guys, as long as they stuck with pandemic fraud, they're not going to get arrested. They're not going to get caught. And that's just one channel on Telegram. You've got hundreds of channels that deal with fraud. Meanwhile, you know, we're talking about <laughs> law enforcement, 37,000 FBI agents. And I know for a fact that less than 200 of them concentrate on cybercrime. So how do you how do you ever combat that? And that it comes back to what we were, you know, kind of alluding to at the beginning of it's it has to be this this concerted effort. It has to be your your industry, it has to be proper regulation, it has to be law enforcement, but everyone's got to work together like that phone company with the banks. If you're not reporting it in a timely manner, how in the hell can can the banks stop the fraud that's going on? They can't. And I don't know, you know, we mentioned it's not going to stop. And I, I kind of agree with you. I kind of agree with that. And I, I think <laughs> yeah. that's why I, I feel such apathy that's going on, because I think everyone kind of knows that, but no one's wanted to talk about that. Because How many people know, have have talked like you and I and then have gone to the dark side because it's more profitable? <laughs> yeah, or out of yeah. apathy or whatever. And I'm not I'm right. not about to go back to, to fraud or crime. I'm not. But uh I am I do have an outdate from the cybersecurity industry. I, you know, my sentence <laughs> ends when I turn 60. I'm 53 right now. So I've got a little less than seven years when I hang up the, the hat, so to speak, and then call it quits. Maybe go into a restaurant business or some shit like that. I don't know, but something different. You could still be on the show right i think so i think we'll still bitch about something okay good <laughs> maybe just a different different industry altogether we'll <laughs> talk about how the restaurant industry sucks yeah <laughs> restaurant maybe, security maybe i'll go back into landscape you've got those ash tree problems yeah something yeah like that isn't that what people like us do when when we retire it. i think that's it something with something different you know It'll be done <laughs> How's life treating you, Mark? We're going to wrap this up. But how's life treating you overall? Oh, pretty good. I'm healthy. Uh, I, I exercise. I eat well. So that's pretty key. You know, that's if you're key. when you get to be, you know, our age, I'm 50 something. 50, so I'm 53. That's what I have. 57. And, uh, good. you know, I've been exercising and working out a lot and eating well. And so that's pretty key. You got to keep moving and everything. I did. Yeah. I've been I've impinged my shoulder over here. I don't know if you can tell, but just they're different sizes. But uh, yeah, what happened there, man? Uh, a shoulder impingement. I uh, did something to my uh, ligament there, and what is that called? A rotor? Yeah, rotator. Rotor cuff. cuff uh, rotor, rotator cuff. Yeah. Is it rotator or rotor? Yeah, that's, uh, uh, I've got some right ones too. I've, I'm scheduled for a doctor to. I was doing these exercise. exercises. You know, and I yeah. got tendonitis on this shoulder here. I should not. I should not have done those exercises. Yeah, mine were uh, were in, inverted push ups. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, when you get our age, you gotta warm up a lot. I never right. warmed up in my entire life, so now I have to. So, pretty good, pretty healthy, no huge problems, uh, nothing to complain about. I do have a job and a career, so that's good. And I mean, the economy right now bad. it continues to go down. So, yeah, that kind of sucks. Yeah, it kind of sucks. I tried so little. I tried a little bit of stock marketing there and uh, Robin Hood app. That? It was it was doing good, and then you know Biden hit, <laughs> and then everything's. Well, I mean, you may as well say it because it's true. <laughs> everything is, uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's like I I don't want to get political, but it's like it gets worse every single day. I don't know who else is playing for it. <laughs> I don't either. I don't either. You know, but. 
to hear them say it, you know, it's it's we won't have a recession. And if we do, it's going to be very light, very light. <laughs> I wish it'd be over with already. Jeez, yes. it's been too long. Yes. Same here. Well, Mark, man, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Yeah, thank you, Brett. Appreciate it. Uh, love your hat, by the way. Giga horns. You going to come back on the show pretty soon? Anytime you want. I like that. All right. <laughs> Take That's care, Mark. Brett. Or uh, Don Johnson. <laughs> Don Johnson. That is Mark Quibell, outstanding human being and always a joy to talk to. Thank you so much, Mark. All right, so that was episode number 73, sitting down with Mark Quibell. Hey, I'm Brett Johnson. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Brett Johnson Show. We're going to close things out. How do we do that? We do it by saying stay safe, stay secure, stay vigilant, but more importantly, understanding that this is the Brett Johnson Show. At the end of the day, just do the right damn thing. I'm Brett Johnson. I want to thank you all for taking the time to tune in and listen. Hey, please subscribe if you like the show. Please subscribe if you don't like the show. Leave me a comment. Bitch, moan, complain. Hey, tell me I'm doing a good job. Just say hello, if nothing else. With that, we're going to close things out. Until next time, I'm Brett Johnson. Take care.